No, not yet. We're still getting some bugs out. Oh, okay. We're ready to go. Like we're getting the bugs out of the system. So I will be very brief in my remarks so that we can get to the, the lecture. Uh, my name is Stan Sklara. I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker uh, to, the, to, to, to speak about the topic that's shown on the screen here. And uh, it's a, an honor to welcome you on campus. I'm sorry I can't stay for all of your talk, but I look forward to hearing the first part. Um, the, I, we'll hear a bit about the lecture series. Uh, it's a distinguished lecture series. But I'd like to make a few comments about the the, uh, the centers uh, and at the centers for economic development at, and global economic development at Boston University, uh, which are really landmarks in the international landscape. They bring um, both uh, a lot of accolades to Boston University. They help us attract excellent students and faculty. Uh, they also serve as a place where students engage in meaningful questions that have immediate impact on today's world and prepare them to go off and be change makers. As educators, we see this as the multiplier effect of what we do. I'm a computer scientist. I could easily have a different type of job. In fact, I did for five years. I chose to go into academia because of working with students who drive us to ask questions that we would not have thought about, challenge us in our assumptions that we'd make about the world. And so it's to you, the students, that I really want to extend a special welcome and I look forward to seeing how you take the ideas that you hear about today and use them in how you think about the problems that the world is facing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Pazerman, who will introduce the lecture. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dean Sklaroff, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you to our in-person and uh, virtual audiences uh, joining us today for the annual Paul Streeton Distinguished Lecture in Global Development Policy, presented by Rohini Pandey, uh, who's a renowned economist, and uh, Henry J. Heinz II, Professor of Economics and Director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale University, and she is also an enthusiastic and distinguished rock climber. Um, before I begin, I would like to make note of a few uh, logistics for today's event. Uh, this event is hybrid via Zoom, uh, and we are also live streaming today's, today's discussion on YouTube. Uh, for those joining us in person, you are welcome to join us for a one-hour reception following the lecture. Uh, the reception will take, in, uh, take place in one of the adjoining rooms. Um, to begin, our distinguished lecturer will give her remarks. Uh, she will then be joined on stage by Dr. Rachel Bruhl, Assistant Professor of Global Development Policy with the Pardee School of Global Studies, uh, for a discussion. Uh, then there will be an audience Q&A session. Uh, for those on our virtual audience, please use the Q&A box in your uh, Zoom menu to enter your questions uh, alongside with your name and affiliation. And for our in-person audience, uh, a member of our events team will come over and bring microphones to you if you want to ask questions. Uh, let me now give you a brief introduction on the history of the street and lecture, and I will then also introduce uh, our distinguished speaker. Uh, so the Paul Streeton Distinguished Lecture in Global Development Policy celebrates the example and legacy of Boston University professor Paul Streeton as an eminent economist and interdisciplinary scholar who has had a significant impact on global development policy. Um, this lecture is sponsored by the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, the Institute for Economics Development, and the Department of Economics. So you'll notice there are not a, lot of, a number of different sponsors, and this reflects the breadth of Professor Steeton's engagement at Boston University during his years as Professor of Economics and Director of the World Development Institute. Uh, the annual Streeton Lecture has three goals. Uh, first and foremost, it honors uh, the impact and legacy of Paul Streeton's scholarship and policy engagement. Uh, second, the lectureship uh, seeks to shine light on scholars working in the Streeton tradition who pursue rigorous scientific research while connecting with other disciplines and the policy community to advance financial stability, 
human well-being, good governance, and environmental sustainability across the developing world. Third, the lectureship hopes to inspire younger scholars to pursue interdisciplinary research on pressing development problems and thereafter actively engage with the policy community. Um, let me now uh, move to introducing our distinguished speaker. Uh, Professor Rohini Pandey is the Henry Heinz Professor of Economics and Director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale University. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Pandey's research is largely focused on how formal and informal institutions shape our relationships and patterns of economic, political, and environmental advantage in society, particularly in developing countries. She is interested in the role of public policy in providing the poor and disadvantaged political and economic power, and how notions of economic justice and human rights can help justify and enable such change. Her most recent work focuses on testing innovative ways to make the state more accountable to its citizens, such as strengthening women's economic and political, political opportunities, ensuring that environmental regulations reduce harmful emissions, and providing citizens uh, effective means to voice their demand for state services. Uh, in 2018, Pandey received the Caroline Bell Shaw Award from the American Economic Association for promoting the success of women in the economics profession, she is, she is the co-chair of the political economy and government group at Jamil uh, Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL, uh, a board member of the Bureau of Research on Economic Development and a former co-editor of the Review of Economics and Statistics. Prior to Yale, Professor Pandey was the Rafiq Hariri Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard Kennedy School, where she co-founded Evidence for Policy Design. Uh, Pandey received a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics, a BA MA in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford University, and a BA in economics from Delhi University. Um, and uh, I'll finish by giving a brief introduction to uh, today's talk. Uh, so today's uh, talk, Professor Pandey joins us to present a lecture titled, A Woman's Work is Never Done how gender norms enable labor coercion inside and outside the home. Um, gender inequities are in part sustained by conservative gender norms and moral codes that advantage men at the expense of women in households, the labor market, and politics. Uh, these norms, these are social rules that women must obey to be thought of as good women and citizens, make society less efficient and less productive. Yet they persist because those who benefit from them have an economic incentive and more importantly, the economic and political power to strategically deploy them to their own advantage. Uh, meanwhile, women that are subjected to these norms face a catch-22. Uh, so they have to be good workers and advance their career, but then to be seen as good workers and make progress in their careers, they're also required to support and nurture co-workers and provide mentorship and, you know, participate in you know, committees and whatnot uh, alongside their own work. And you know, this is a tax on women's work. In the home, the free domestic labor required by gender norms inevitably reduces women's ability to generate income that might allow them to negotiate domestic responsibilities on an equal footing. In the face of these powerful domestic economic incentives, addressing gender inequality in the workplace and in the home will require more than encouraging individuals to change their behavior or mandates that seek to compensate women for the labor market costs of gender norms. You actually need to challenge the norm itself. Lasting equality will require collective action on the part of women and their allies and public policies that acknowledge and respond to the fact that a society that enforces conservative gender norms gives men both disproportionate access to money and power and the ability to sustain that access. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all the 2024 Paul Streeton Distinguished Lecturer in Global Development Policy, Professor Amin Pandey. Thank you very much for the very uh, generous introduction and more importantly for inviting me here. It's absolutely fantastic to be here and I really appreciate um, the chance to talk to you about something that as you'll see is in some ways more of an argument in some parts than having every uh, step of it pinned down by uh, rigorous uh, causal evidence. 
And so certainly I'd also appreciate both in the Q&A and afterwards um, as much pushback as you want to give me on this, since this is very much uh, the broader agenda is work in progress. I should also highlight that this is really not just my work. I have many people who have I work with who's uh, hopefully I've listed most of them, and they've really led from the front on much of this work. And I finally, just before I start, I should say the title says how gender norms enable labor coercion inside and outside the home. But you know, I started writing the talk, and by the time I got to what I think will be 40 minutes, I realized I largely just talked about coercion inside the home. So hopefully I'll get to outside the home and later work, but probably um, not today. So let me start um, by actually just a, a word on Paul Streeton. I think you know all of us at different points have read his work, his work especially on basic needs. Um, I was in Oxford for a few years where not only did he study, but I think he played an extremely important role in starting or heading Queen Elizabeth Hall, which was the large development policy. And it was always very impressive to see how he tried to maintain a very strong connection between the research he did and the world of policy. And I think that was um, epitomized by his focus on the idea that we can't just wait for economic growth, even if we think that's important, but we need to turn to uh, thinking about basic needs and how we fill them. I wanted to start from a quote um, in a 1984 piece he wrote, where the quote is, the paragraph is long, but I can tell you it was in the context of education of women, and he was talking about unanswered questions in this area. And to quote, he says, the pleas of the women's liberation movement are in conflict with the pleas of those who call for an improvement in the specifically feminine roles of wife and mother. And he saw this as being a conflict that really determines whether or not we think uh, human education, sorry, education is something that, you know, should be seen as a basic need for women. And so I think, I think of this talk in some ways responding to uh, one part of that, um, of this um, phrase, by really asking the question that Streeton phrases this really as an ideological conflict between two views. I think what I want to try to put forward that perhaps some of this is actually uh, reflecting a gendered struggle over resources where conservative norms in some ways are being weaponized in order to uphold dominance of a certain group. And I think if you get convinced at all that this may be part of the story, I think it, gives it, it makes it easier to answer this unanswered question because then it's no longer a question of two ideologies, but rather it's just a question of basic rights, which I think was central to Streeton's basic needs hypothesis. So I want to um, kind of take the talk in three parts. Um, I'm gonna start with just a set of uh, pictures. And I want to use these pictures to um, try to highlight the ways in which uh, marriage is central to the outcomes we see for women and how they differ from those from men. I want to then argue that, you know, this. Given these patterns we see in the data, and I should say that I'm largely going to focus throughout the talk on evidence from India, but I think a lot of this is generalizable beyond that, and we can talk about it later. Um, and you have to think about um, the contract of marriage as a coercive contract. So in the economics literature, very often this kind of labor coercion is considered is thought in terms of forced labor or slavery. And I want to try to think about ways in which we can actually use this analogy to think about marriage, where the, the ability to coerce comes from the use of gender norms. And then finally, um, against that thesis, I want to talk about if we were to take this view seriously, what does it mean for how we affect change? And I just want to talk about some evidence there from experiments that I and my fantastic colleagues have, have done over the years. So let me start with some pictures. So I think the first one is one that would be very familiar to everyone in this room is that when we think about just labor force participation across the globe, we know that um, male labor force participation tends to be relatively high and quite similar across countries. On the other hand, when we look at female labor force participation, we see a lot more variation. And really, I think the aim of showing this graph was really to highlight the countries where I'm working right now, uh, or the country rather where I'm working right now, which is India, which you can see has uh, low labor force participation globally. Now, I think what's striking is when you see this low labor force participation is to, is to understand that 
who is which are the groups that are not working for pay and it is often in south asia uh, women who are very poor and i think this is striking because when we think of extreme poor we think of labor as really the primary way in which they earn income and so i think in the e economics 101 textbooks when we talk about what do the extreme poor do we say they provide labor they uh, work in self they are self employed in agriculture or wage labor and that view very often in some ways takes talks about the household um, and doesn't realize that to a large extent very often poor parts of the world is actually talking about men uh, and i think that's a, that that's this is a population where if you think about kind of claudia golden's seminal work this is not a population where the income effect is large enough that they should be dropping out of the labor market because the household is enough income. This is a, these are very poor households. And so, so just on the basis of this data, for instance, the World Bank computes that in South Asia, for every 100 men living in extreme poverty, 109 women live in extreme poverty. And that difference is really coming because uh, women are not working. It's also the case that this is not something that's, you know, a question of education or economic growth will take care of it. So this is um, a graph for India. So uh, I do what I always tell my students is the cardinal sin of having two different axes on, on a single graph. But forgive me for that. I couldn't think of a better way of putting it. So uh, on the on your left hand side, uh, the axis captures labor force participation. And I actually showed men on a totally different graph because otherwise it all, women, women participation is so low that you won't actually see the variation is all put on the same graph. So male participation is roughly constant, maybe a slight dip. The dark blue line shows you the dramatic growth that's taken place in India. But what you see for women is they start at at most 30%. And if anything, we've seen over the period of 2005 to 2015, a decline in female labor force participation from very low levels. So again, I think coming back to Streeton, this is exactly the kind of world where you would say, if you think about basic needs, it's going to look very different than just saying economic growth should achieve uh, the outcomes we want. And just to be clear, the difference we're talking about here is not saying that these are women sitting at home enjoying leisure. So this is time use data from the 2019 National Sample Survey. And so if you look at the cumulative graph, that's the total number of minutes in a day that group is working. And you know, married women and married men work pretty much the same number of, same amount of time. Uh, if anything, maybe a few minutes more for women, but there's a huge difference in who's getting paid. Uh, the majority of the work that a married woman is doing is unpaid work in the care economy, while the flip is true of that for men. And, and then, when we look at this difference, the next thing to realize is that this difference is very, so in a lot of settings in rich countries, we often talk about this difference as um, part of what people call the child penalty. That when you have children, that's when women drop out of the labor market and that's when we start seeing these differences. This is not the case in a country like India. So to see this, this is from um, kind of the labor force survey in India, the nationally represented one from 2022. So what you see for men is, in some ways, what you would expect. So what do we have on the uh, basic axis? We have this cohort, so it's by, it's by age. And so you can see if you're a 15-year-old boy, you're largely in school. So that's the light blue, you're unmarried. You're, you're either a combined worker and student. At this point, it's largely students. As you get older, you start getting married and you transition from light blue to dark blue. So you transition from being married to unmarried. But your labor market status isn't changing. Uh, you, 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 you're continuing to work. There's a very, very small uh, orange bar, which is when you're married and neither a worker nor a student, but it's, it's really minimal. Compare this to exactly the same graph for women, and the difference is striking. What you see is at the age of 15, um, boys and girls look similar. They're both in school. Um, as, as they get older, they both st stop being in school as much. But while for men, the transition to marriage uh, doesn't change the labor market outcomes, for women, this huge orange area appears. And what this orange area is, you're married, you're neither working nor a student. And I'm not going to show you the data, but I can tell you there is no additional effect uh, in terms of having a child. Um, so in, in India, women don't enter the labor market. It's not that they're entering the labor market and then leaving at the time when they have kids. 
And when we look at the status quo, you can ask, well, what does this reflect? Um, again, if this is uh, survey data from, uh, from uh, surveys that I've done, I'm going to flip at some points between um, the data from uh, the large scale um, national surveys, but also very often turn to the surveys that we did in the context of experiments. So this is asking households who makes decisions about whether a woman takes employment outside the house and then how she spends her earnings. But if you look at the second set of graphs, which is about you know where she where, who decides whether she takes employment outside the household, what you see is that essentially it's less than twenty percent of the cases where a woman decides on her own. In the majority, she decides it's her husband who decides, and in some cases they decide together. But it's largely the husband who decides. Now you could say, well, the husband decides, but maybe he's you know what we would call. Um, you know, a benevolent dictator. Maybe he's just putting in place the views that um, the uh, wife wants. That's not, again, what the data suggests. So just to give you two examples with the data, um, if you look at nationally representative data where uh, women who were not working um, or who were only engaged in domestic activities were asked a question that if there was work, av if there was work avail available for at a wage, would you be willing to take it up? a third of the women said yes, they wanted to work. Recent work by two um, uh, young, young uh, postdoctoral fellows who were students of mine, uh, Patrick Agthe and uh, Ariel Bernhardt, used a different data set, the IHDS, which is also a national survey, to compute how, much, how this translated into absolute numbers. And what they found that roughly, they calculated that 100 million Indian women are forbidden from working. They want to work, but state that they're not able to work uh, because of social norms. And then when you look at, it's not just labor market. I think a second extremely important way in which women's um, agency is affected is by, is by social isolation. Um, you, you look in the, national, the demographic and health survey for India, the most recent one in 21, um, there's a reasonable number of people where there's, there's a clear statement that they're not being allowed to meet female friends. And so I think the question, and this is really the rest of the talk, is you know, why is it that women and their parents, and in many cases their husbands, are both accepting and, and on occasion enforcing such a division of labor? Um, you know, is it because, as Streeton said, because there's just this ideological division in what is appropriate to do? It's certainly true that that's the case. But what is actually sustaining that? And that really brings me, I think, to the second part of what I'm going to turn to now, which is to think about what we would think of as the role of um, labor coercion. So before turning to that, let me just define a term that I think is going to be re repeatedly used um, in uh, making this argument, which is this case of norms. So I'm going to use the many different quite comparable definitions. So I'm going to use a definition from two psycho, uh, social psychologists who define norms as a grammar of social interactions that outlines behaviors that are going to be deemed acceptable by society. Now, when we uh, look at how economists have tend to ask, how does this affect behavior? They tend to distinguish between three different components. So the first is your own beliefs. So men and women have their own beliefs of what they think is appropriate behavior for them. So this is what I think is the right thing for me to do. There's then what we would say in a community are the actual norms, which is really just the aggregation of these beliefs. So what is it that is seen as appropriate by the majority or you know, X percent of the community as appropriate behavior? And then finally, there are perceived norms. What do I believe my community thinks is appropriate behavior? And these, I think, are the three ways in which we have uh, very often in, in, our, in our work kind of rationalized and then tried to understand um, how norms affected. So against this background gender norms, let me now turn to um, how I want to think about coercion. So I'm going to reference um, you know, a model and work done by Asimoglu and Wolitsky, who developed a model of labor coercion, which they used in the context of uh, thinking about, as I said, largely slavery and forced labor. So they define labor coercion um, not as the act of, for say, providing labor on any single day, are you beaten to do it, but rather your willingness to accept a contract 
in which uh, you're going to accept work on terms that are perhaps what we say, say below market wage, right? So they define it as labor coercion exists when force or the threat of force plays a central role in convincing individuals to accept work. And so I'm interested in the argument that when is it that gender norms end up enabling a situation in which families or women agree to accept a marital contract, the terms of which involve social isolation and taking on the bulk of unpaid work. And I think there are three different ways in which I see norms working here. First is it frames taking up this contract as a moral imperative. If you're a good woman, this is what you do. This is the contract you accept. You take on work at home without pay unquestioningly. The second is it makes also the threat of punishment permissible. So if I am a man who beats my wife, this is now okay because she's doing something that is against the norm. So if you are not norm compliant, you can be punished for it. And that is something that is accepted. And then finally, of course, you know, men and women uh, want to have children, but it, for women having a child outside uh, uh, the marriage contract is again something that's often made harder by norms. So the labor market in many ways will penalize you, especially in a setting like India, if you're trying to be a single mother. So another reason why you might accept the marriage contract is you want to have a child and the only way realistically that you can have a child and bring them up is to actually accept the terms of this contract. A second point that Asimoglu and Wolitsky make, and I think this is going to be important in thinking about uh, how to affect change, is that they argue that what economists will call the participation constraint, the willingness to accept this contract, is going to be easier to satisfy for workers with a worse outside option and interestingly, in this case, those with the worst outside option are going to, in equilibrium, actually exert more effort. And hence, for, for in, yes, the employer or, the, or the, in this case, the husband, the way you get someone, say, who's more productive at unpaid work is actually those who have a worse outside option. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of evidence suggesting that by conservative gender norms of the form that, for instance, make it unacceptable to work in certain types of jobs are, in effect, worsening the outside option of women and justifying also punishing them if they don't accept this role. So let me give you some examples from you know, my work and other works. So at the bottom are the papers that I reference where I get this from. So, you know, a norm would be, for instance, that, you know, daughters should remain chaste and pure for their uh, future husbands. And the activity that would justify is you should have limited physical mobility. Or that, you know, girls should be uh, supervised when they're using their phone. And this means that they're going to be socially isolated and have a limited uh, labor market network. This is not just pre-marriage. This also continues post-marriage. So, for instance, um, you would have... Um, you know, a norm that your role is to be a caregiver, that's the primary role you have in society. And what this means is that you're going to end up with low labor uh, force participation and an ability to leave in turn ban marriages. Let me now give you a specific example of how I've sort of seen this play out. So let me start with the data, a set of data. So this is from the IHDS data set. So what this shows you, it was a question in the household uh, roster which asked for every household member whether they had access to a phone and they could use a phone. So what this shows you is a male and female mobile phone use. So the statement being in the household that they have access and are able to use a phone. The blue line is for men and the orange line is for women. Now, basically for kids, so between 10 to 15, the way the phone use was typically working is that they were being given access to the phone by their parents. Um, the dotted line shows you um, marriage rates of women in this population. And essentially what's really stark is at the point at which girls hit puberty, roughly around 15 in this population, is where you see this difference emerging after which uh, women's uh, mobile phone certainly does not increase and decline. So you can think you're moving off from sharing your parents' phone to just not being given a phone at all. While for men, this increases steadily. And this was 2012, which was, you know, in the digital world, that's not 10 years ago. That's like, I don't know, three centuries ago in far, and so far. But I can assure you that we have more recent data. You see a very similar pattern there. So 
we had this graph and we were interested in exploring it. So what we did is we, we conducted a set of interviews across a range of settings. So these were going from um, uh, very urban populations in Delhi to relatively rural populations in Gwalior and Tanjabur. Um, and what you see is, again, very similar to um, explanations for why girls don't get phones, which really map back to these norms. So for instance, phones are a risk to women's reputation. Um, they are going to be at the will of others to learn. So it challenges purity, it challenges subservience. And so we see, you know, we see exactly this, a new technology has come in that could possibly be a source of labor market entry or in reducing social isolation. And you see exactly the same norms being used to get a very similar form of gender gap. Now, I also said that another way in which norms um, sustain coercion is they justify the use of violence towards women. So of course, in general, men are typically stronger than women, and so they can impose physical violence within the home. Um, but then what you, the, you, if you can socially shame the fact that you, know, um, you, were, you were the type of person who your husband was forced to be violent towards, through the use of some norm, the man himself doesn't pay, uh, as, uh, face so much of a penalty. And then very often women who, and I think we see this not just in India, we see this in the US and other countries, women who are socially isolated or economically isolated are much more vulnerable to accepting such violence um, and believing they didn't have options. So if you look at the National Family Health Survey data, um, you know, I think violence on, I, Intimate partner violence is roughly a third that possibly is underreported given this population. Perhaps the data I found most striking that there were just 20% of women who said that they were never afraid of their husband. Right? The major the way over the majority, 80% of women either most of the time or some of the time are afraid of their husband. I think that to me is a much stronger expression, the kind of latent fear you see. And then when you think about, you know, where is the justification coming from? So the DHS surveys, as many people in this room will know, are uh, only administered to women, so married women uh, of reproductive age. So what we can look at to see, which I think you can imagine as acceptance, is what is the proportion of women who justify, who see violence as justified for, and for what reasons, and are the reasons for which they see violence justified related to norms. And here what we see, perhaps the one that I find the most striking is over 20% of women uh, think that being beating is justified if a wife doesn't cook food properly. Um, and you know all of them, you can link back to norms. And then the other thing you see that in each of these categories, this proportion is higher for women who also state in the same survey that they're not allowed to meet their friends. So again, you're socially isolated, your outside option is reduced, and then potentially if you don't do the right thing, you're going to get punished for it. So why do we see this happen? Like what in the data can we see justifies a set of uh, pretty horrible outcomes of economic and social isolation for women? And you know, you can have a view that uh, there are abusive men and that's what drives it. Or you can have a view that you know, at some level, the reason why it gets accepted is that much of it, which is not as horrible as extreme violence, is also perpetuating a status quo that benefits some groups. And I think there's a lot of evidence. You can see that in NFHS. I had realized, perhaps not as much as I should have, that I will run out of time. So I've been measuring a lot of statistics. But you know, it allows men to have power just within the household. You see this all the time when you ask questions like who, who decides on, say, large purchases in the household. It enables the delegation of unpaid care economy work to women, which further then increase the male ability to work. And then in the workplace, there are variants of this that also limit competition from female co-workers. The costs are high. Um, you know, when this is from the surveys that I'll come to soon, you know, the, you're socially isolated and, you know, levels of mental health um, depressions are very high in these populations. Um, they are also, it's important to recognize that it's not just women. There are very often couples in the data we'll see where both men and women own beliefs are that women should work, that you know, they shouldn't be isolated, but that their perceived perceptions of community norms 
are that that they are going to uh, face stigma, especially among men, if the women undertake these activities. And so I think the part of the talk that I didn't have time to lay out is really to think about how this kind of use of gender norms within the household can actually perpetuate class inequality in society as a whole. So with that, let me now, um, so it's checking my time. Okay, um, I think I have another 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah. So I want to now turn to a, a bit more, um, move away from a bit more depressing topics, really think about, is this a setting in which we can actually affect change? Or is this something I've said, economic growth isn't going to, isn't going to work. Can we, is there some value to thinking through um, the theory of it or trying to put an argument to actually try to then think about how you can affect change? So I think some of the promising evidence comes, let me just go back to the qualitative surveys I did. So I talked in some ways about the evidence that you really saw much more on the left-hand side, right? So these kind of ideas that boys and girls both deteriorate by using phones, but girls need to be controlled. They are the respect of our house. But now if you go all the way to the right, which was also what we heard in our interviews, I always think and say that if she will not come out from the nest, then how will she know how to fly? When children sit in the group, it's not necessary that they will not fall in bad friendships. They can also learn from good thoughts. Um, and then I think similarly, uh, you know, I feel, I feel fear that with whom this girl is talking, um, and then you know, another statement on the other side, we, the younger generation, don't think like this as we have today's era. So when you look at the data, you do see variation. Typically younger, but particularly women, are much more liberal in the data uh, relative to men. And I think that's important because very often when we write down um, economic models, we tend to, or when we talk about the data, we tend to talk about norms varying at the level of society. So we say that you know, India is conservative, but we don't actually say that in India also that this, the, the difference between the norms believed by men and women is, uh, is relatively large, that the disjunction between genders and what they believe is appropriate is larger. And I think that's important because if you, if you believe that beliefs are different in the population, and then you take uh, kind of arguments like that as a Moglu-Wolitsky argument, then you might say that actually changing outside options may have bite in this population. Because these are now populations where actually women potentially are liberal, but they, are, they actually are not able to exercise the outside option. And so I'm going to talk about uh, evidence from two experiments and then broaden out a bit. One is, um, and I think that's uh, whether just providing more control over earnings. I think that's a classic way that economists think about it is, does that help? The second one, which uh, is actually just something we finished but haven't written up yet, is really to ask about the role that mobile phones can play. If you reduce social isolation, and here the outcome I'm going to be interested in much more is just mental health, which I think is perhaps in some ways at least as important an outcome as thinking about, say, labor outcomes, is do you actually see effects there? So I'm going to talk about these two populations, very similar populations, actually neighboring states. Chhattisgarh was in part carved out of Madhya Pradesh. Um, the samples we have for both settings are uh, large groups of married couples where we've typically surveyed both the men and women. And among these women, um, the majority of them are married between the ages of 15 to 17. So certainly uh, before the legal age of marriage. Um, largely, these women don't work. And I'm going to often talk about women who at baseline are surveys didn't work as constrained women. And they report significant uh, spousal control. So in a Madhya Pradesh sample, 32% reported uh, spousal violence, and in Chhattisgarh, 68% reported emotionally controlling behavior by husbands. So the first paper, and I think you know, some of you may have seen this, it's already published work. What we did is we took this population um, and we first ensured everyone had bank accounts. And then what we were interested in is comparing a woman who had a bank account and possibly worked with a woman who had a bank account, worked for a public sector program, and had direct deposit. And you know, the idea of direct deposit mattering for women is something that goes back to being discussed in the US in the 1960s as well. And we were interested in asking whether that has an effect. So after three years, what we saw was that the women who received uh, the direct deposit accounts had higher labor supply. They were more likely to work in both the public and the private sector. And we argued that this finding 
cannot be explained by kind of just a simple uh, model where once you have um, you know higher income because now you have your own direct deposit account, you you work more. The typical effect in economics would be at that point you're slightly richer, so you should work less. But it can be explained in a model where you're constrained by norms. And this actually allows you to uh, react against the norm because you have more bargaining power. But what I want to focus on today is uh, the effects we see on norms. So 2017 was a th three year study and we've just finished, just in the process of hopefully finishing, uh, cleaning and analyzing the data from an eight year follow up we did in 2022. And as I said, kind of constrained women are those who didn't work at baseline. So consistent with what we saw earlier, on your own gender norms, women are, have liberalized. These were questions like, for instance, do you, do you think it's appropriate for a woman to work? Uh, and then we had a set of vignette questions who asked them, are you, you know, who is a good mother, who is a good woman, depending on whether or not she worked. And we see significant liberalization among women on their own beliefs. We didn't see uh, a positive or negative change in their perceptions of the community norms in 2017, but in 2022, which was also post COVID, so it was a period where the labor market was tightening, we now begin to see uh, some evidence that they actually perceive the community as being more conservative. If you look at their husbands, in the, neither in the three year or the eight year follow up did we see their own um, beliefs change. Strikingly, we actually see some evidence that these men at least state in terms of perceived community norms, more liberal norms. Um, and so I think, you know, one thing we, uh, we, we, we think is that there's an interesting question of whether women's perceptions of the community norm actually really reflects what they think of their husband's beliefs, which they're seeing is not changing over time. But overall, what we find is that, you know, this greater financial control, even eight years later, we see these women have changed beliefs about their own behavior. But unfortunately, it seems that their perceptions of their community are getting worse. And it is possible that these norm, this potentially normative backlash is going to limit their from seeking further freedom of opportunity. And I think this is one of the reasons I've sort of increasingly come to the view that we should we should certainly try to empower individually, but you need some kind of system or some kind of collective setting which can support them in ensuring that you know they see community as supporting them, not something that is actually turning against them. I let me now turn uh, in the last few minutes that I have to um, a second um, set of work which we again just completed where we were interested in asking, what does mobile phones do? So there's a lot of buzz about mobile phones. I think every development agency right now is talking about how this is going to be the solution for you know, women who can't, for instance, work outside the house by saying, now you know, you'll know you have work come to the house, you'll just be able to earn all this money just working for Microsoft or whoever else and you know doing AI work from home. You know, it's one population that people believe AI is actually going to help. So we were in a setting where um, the government actually decided to give women free smartphones. Um, it was an election, pre-election um, rollout where they had kind of a population rule and they said they'll give it to villages above that population before the election, others after the election, then they lost the election. So it never continued on. So that gave us a natural regression discontinuity way of studying this. So we do two things. We compare just the effect of the pure uh, phone distribution scheme using a regression discontinuity. And then we also um, used, uh, we also overlaid on top of it in a set of villages that got the smartphone, a digital training program where women were really taught, you know, you have a smartphone, what does this mean? How do you use its features? So when we look at the effects of the pure phone distribution, in the short run, of course, there was a sharp increase in smartphone ownership. Um, however, even in, the, even in the short run, we actually saw gender gaps in advanced task use increase. So even if women stated that they owned the phone, their husbands were using the phones for WhatsApp, for YouTube, and things like that. So the gender gap in advanced task use uh, went up. And then when we look at this three years later, we no longer see any gains in stated female smartphones. Maybe they broke, but more likely they just moved within the household to sons and fathers. In contrast, when this program was supplemented with digital training, and we again look at it uh, two years later, 
sorry. What we see is, um, we see, we don't see a change in smart ownership, but we see a significant increase in what we call advanced task use. So these are things like WhatsApp, uh, YouTube, taking a photograph. Importantly, what we see is they're more likely to talk to uh, our relatives. We also see, which I don't report here, an increase in their reported network and improvements in, so in mental health, which are reasonably significant when we, we compare them to other um, estimates in the literature. So in this population, you know, the, the challenge is to make sure the phones stay with women and they're able to use it. And that's not easy. Just giving a woman a phone doesn't achieve this. Somehow we managed to do it with our digital training. Conditional on doing that, uh, women are more likely to you know, talk to friends and <laughs> relatives on the phone, and they report lower levels of uh, social isolation. So I think you know, it, it does seem that if women gain and are able to hold on to better outside options, the, their economic and social well-being improves very much consistent with these models of how the outside option matters. But I, I've also come to believe that if you just work on trying to change this woman by woman, you can change her beliefs, you can change anticipation, but it can often be short-lived if the change tries to remain just within the household, because in the end, it's still her against others in the household. I think there's growing amount of evidence, um, I think a lot in political science and other fields as well, that you know, if you can increase women's networks across households, or you can create ways of solidarity that expand beyond the household, that may be a more promising venue to try to work on together with just changing uh, outside options for women and actually sustaining longer run change. And so let me just kind of conclude with, I think, the comments that Daniel uh, made at the start about the talk. You know, I think it's clear to us, and this is clear from evidence, not just I presented, but I think just from a lot of evidence on gender studies in rich countries, you know, negotiation uh, trials or, you know, trying to tell women to lean in at work, these things don't work. Uh, we now have a lot of evidence that just getting an individual in the face of exist, to not change the normative environment and ask women to kind of be more norm compliant in a way doesn't actually improve their economic well-being. Similarly, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that, for instance, um, if you simply provide uh, you know, longer maternity leave, that doesn't do anything very much beyond the point for women's outcomes. Childcare certainly helps, but not just increasing maternity leave. And I think it's all has the same nature. You're not challenging the norm. You're trying to say, let's keep the norm and within it provide, create space. And I think that's a very hard thing to do. And so this is the part which I think is a little bit more, um, I think maybe more forward looking than I have all the evidence for. But I think if we take the body of evidence out there, it seems to me the place where we find the most consistent pattern is that you know, collective action, this could take the form of women in Iceland going on strike for equal wages, which then led to you know, the first female president in the world and women's political parties, but it's hard to study with a sample of one. Do I think you know collective actions of the form that you have uh, you know microfinance or self help based groups? Um, I think these and uh, these will have an effect. The harder one, of course, is to have public policies that starts by acknowledging and responding to the fact that society that enforces conservative norms is giving one group dis disproportionate access to money and power. And as someone who sort of let me just conclude with one thing of someone who's worked in political economy, I think since my PhD, it's always struck me that when you talk about class struggles or class interests to say a group like this or any other, I think people don't disagree that class struggle is about economic power. I think when you start talking about gender struggles, somehow we lose our ability to, I don't know, abstract. It, people take it very personally. And so uh, I, think, I think there will be value to sort of just think of gendered struggles as no differently than class struggles and not think that you know by doing this we're sort of saying men are bad or women are good it's just it's just economics it's just this is how money is divided and power is divided and the status quo wants to be maintained and so to challenge it i think we have to start by accepting it but that you know you can do some work on it but then we'll have to see how people react but let me stop here thank you very much Welcome, Hannah. Here we come. It just goes on. Uh, I think it does, yes. Okay.
<laughs> um, so thank you so much, Rohini, for sharing your insights with us from Oh, I lost it. Oh, like now. Okay. Um, and so I just wanted to say, start off by um, proposing one way to think about your work and then this kind of move towards the forward thinking side that you've pushed us towards, which is we could think about your you know broader volume of work as um, a general equilibrium theory of patriarchy. Um, and one of the things you notice and point out is that we see this remarkable stability. Um, and persistence, not only because the current distribution of resources, um, not just materially, but politically and status-wise, privileged men, but as you've, you've mentioned, there's this disproportionate access to the ability to accrue uh, wealth, political voice, and social status um, uh, that patriarchal institutions provide to men. Um, and so what you're proposing, what you call at the start of your lecture as a path to lasting gender equality is essentially an equilibrium shift that's required. Um, and to do so, we need some kind of fundamental disruption of the current patriarchal equilibrium. And so I wanted to ask three sets of brief questions that we have a chance for others too, um, but basically about disruption. Well, first in terms of preferences, uh, second in terms of enforcement mechanisms, and third in terms of um, institutional dynamics of power distribution. And so first on the front of preferences, I wanted to ask you if you can kind of flip the frame that you provided us. So um, you started off by saying one way in which we see the status quo um, preference uh, or reflect male preferences is in paid labor force participation. And you provided us a wealth of statistics to back that up. Um, but I also wanted to push you on kind of what you might think of as the inverse of that, um, which is, um, the status quo distribution of unpaid labor, which is actually, I think, comes up more forcefully in your, your talk itself. Uh, so what we think of as care work or the domestic care economy. Um, and I wanted to highlight one of the figures you showed, which was from the NSS in 2019, so not that long ago, um, that married women perform 399 minutes per day, so over six and a half hours of unpaid care work um, as compared to 46 minutes per day for married men. Um, and so I had a, a kind of, I want to give you two ways to address this and you could take either or both, but um, from just like the, the perspective of thinking about models, uh, whether you have a model in mind, because I know in the AER paper you, pre you presented um, some other work, there's a, a lot of work that shows models for how we think about the distribution of preferences for, uh, for paid labor, for wages. Um, I, I wonder if you think there's a great model for uh, how we should expect preferences to shift shift when it comes to unpaid labor. Um, and then kind of a more, um, a narrower way of looking at that that's a little bit more concrete um, comes out of the, the the experimental work that you were showing us uh, from the, the 2021 AER paper, which is when we experimentally vary financial control. And so one would expect that that does shift preferences over the distribution of, of care labor, unpaid labor as well. And I would say there are two potential hypotheses that we could expect. This is, you know, a, a pathway to gender empowerment. We see a more equal balance of unpaid uh, uh, care labor uh, as women's control over uh, finances increases, uh, or we could expect the reverse. We could expect greater backlash um, uh, as uh, which leads to more unbalanced distribution of paid labor, which is actually what we see in practice a lot of the time, I think. And we see, I think, evidence for each of that from uh, this, the, the analysis you showed us. So we see, I really love your measures of own preferences and also perceived uh, community preferences. And we see for women, especially constrained women who didn't work before your experiment, um, that uh, their preferences about both, I would say paid and unpaid work get more progressive as their financial control increases, uh, but their view of community norms uh, actually diverges and for constrained women gets worse. Um, and so I wonder if, I guess the way I'm pushing you here is to think about a theory of backlash. Um, and we might expect greater backlash over time uh, that's as a function of the quantum of change when it comes to the, the distribution of, of material resources. Um, so this is more relevant for constrained women who have a greater 
quantum of you know substantial material resources that they gain. And it might also vary as a function of the scale of divergence between women's and, and men's husbands and wives gender norms, which you note is, is quite large. And I think we see, especially for constrained women, uh, uh, diverges even more dramatically. Uh, and so I guess I think this is a really important domain. And I just want to ask you for any way you want to kind of respond to what we should expect for preferences as a model or in these specific cases um, uh, to, to shift over care labor. That's clearly one of the important cruxes of this labor coercion. So love to hear your thing. Thanks, thanks yeah. uh, for the very thoughtful discussion. So I think um, I slightly alluded to the start. In the end, if you think what's sustaining mm -hmm. um, unpaid work or the care economy is uh, fertility, mm -hmm. it's having children. Mm -hmm. And that may, can make you a bit pessimistic because if you look at the mm -hmm. case of what's happening in richer countries, for instance, if you think what's happening in J Japan and South Korea, you could just say, well, women are just going on strike, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if men are not going to be able to commit in a way that is uh, convincing mm -hmm. that uh, they will actually share part of the unpaid care economy, women will just not have children, that's, or they'll just not enter marriage. And that's what we are seeing. And so that, I think, makes me think that it's not obvious to me this is going to move so fast mm -hmm. because I think in the short or the medium run, what we're going to see is fertility fall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, in fact, what's interesting is I think a lot of the ways in which, um, what, to me, one of the questions that's interesting is how are governments responding to what they see as a crisis in fertility? Mm -hmm. They're actually not responding by saying that uh, we will try to change kind of norms. They're not responding by saying, um, you know, we really want men to step up. They're tending to respond by saying women should step up. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, so if you think about it in China, uh, you know, China has not just gone from saying no longer one child policy. They now want women to have three children. Women are not having three children in China, uh, but they're not actually responding by saying either that will give you, you know, jobs or, you know, you could imagine saying that, you know, your promotions at work are going to actually depend on how many children you have. That could possibly be more successful if you think women have preferences over work, which they seem to. So, so it's, it's an interesting balance that somehow, uh, and this part actually I don't understand fully why, mm -hmm. is why governments are, you know, if they really care about fertility, why they're, they're continuing to follow something that has some success, but not as much as they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think maybe in a country like France, natality policies have been successful, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing them being successful in East Asia. I actually don't think we're going to see them be successful in South Asia, where we've mm -hmm. seen fertility rates falling. So I think, I think largely, I think, I'm more pessimistic that right now we've learned to solve it because in the end, I think to solve this, you have to want men to recognize that if they're going to have kids, you know, they're going to need to actually change the amount of work to produce. Otherwise, once women have enough outside options, they'll move, they'll just stop having kids altogether. Mm -hmm. And that brings me a bit to your second one. I, mm -hmm. I think if you think about when backlash happens, backlash happens when you think you're going to be successful with backlash. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, the reason for my not very well, um, I guess, justified, well, evidenced argument of saying or why you want to provide outside options, not just in terms of changing uh, the amount of money that a woman controls in the household or from her wages, but actually giving her a successful outside option to leave. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think about um, the U.S., I think, uh, uh, and you think about what something like unilateral divorce laws coming in the 1970s did, they seem to have also given women a somewhat more successful way of leaving the household. And so while, you know, Brian Wheaton has very nice recent work saying that there's some backlash we saw around the Equal Rights Agenda action, I think in the end, it was perhaps not that successful mm -hmm. backlash because, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't succeed with it. You couldn't succeed by simply saying we want more conservative norms. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this is a critique of my work and others is that sometimes when we're working by just strengthening women's individual access, we, we're not actually giving them enough power to just walk away and feel very comfortable doing it. And that, I think, then empowers men to use backlash mm -hmm. to come back to the status quo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's um, really insightful. And I guess that leads to my next question, which was about in the enforcement mechanism. So um, as you frame it, violent coercion is playing a very important role in uh, in labor coercion, um, which you illustrate by the latent fear that you know about 80% of women have of their husband. Um, and this is despite the fact that you argue it's welfare reducing um, for everyone involved. 
uh, and and this reminds me of Blah and Rao's uh, discussion of how effective violence can be as a bargaining tool. Um, and so I wanted to push you a little bit more on the the dynamics that you expect to see. Um, uh, both and the coercion into a marriage con contract to start. Um, I, I would wonder if you expect actually higher levels of coercion um, and violence against unmarried women, where women's support for marriage is either lower or more uncertain, harder to predict. Um, and just in the interest of time, the second level that you talk much more about is, is women within marriage. Um, and, and I think you, you kind of end with this hypothesis that um, social solidarity, because so much of uh, coercion within marriage is in, uh, works through social isolation, that social solidarity can be a very powerful tool, particularly through friendships with other women, to enable women's resistance to domestic violence, resilience in terms of mental health, and greater economic autonomy. Um, and I wanted to push you as to whether you think solidarity actually works differently um, in different contexts here. Um, so for example, might where there are household-wide incentives for building solidarity, because things like reciprocal exchange of resources outside of the market is actually valuable for everyone. That might be the, those might be the households where solidarity uh, is most possible and effective for women. Whereas households where the the main good they're interested in accruing or maximizing or optimizing is status, um, solidarity may may actually not be effective at all um, or impossible for women to build. So, you know, I'm curious as to what you think the limits or the promise of solidarity is here. Too. So, you know, I, I don't want to go on too, um, too hard limb because I said mm. this is the least evidence part of mm. um, my talk, but I, th I think that the problem in thinking about um, area, places where there are stronger household networks mm -hmm. is that these are, especially financial networks, if you think about, uh, they are typically sustained by, by men's work. So I think in most data, what mm -hmm. you see is even when you look at like, say, many household network models of which there are many, unfortunately don't distinguish between men's networks and women's networks. To the extent that we know that, we know that uh, women's networks tend to be not just smaller, but tend to have less sort of financial networks engaged with it. And so so I think a household can be very well networked, mm. but women in it can be very poorly networked. So I'm not sure we can actually think about at least our traditional models, just because we haven't actually, we haven't got the data to use it. I think the traditional models are basically thinking about male networks when they're thinking about household networks, mm. often in those models at least. Mm. So I think that's a great area of research that we lay out, but I think I think at this point I probably think that's the open area of research. Okay. That's and I guess the last question I wanted to ask you, and I think answer as much or as little as you want, then we'll go to to broader questions, is just about institutional power dynamics, um, which I think are are particularly relevant. You show us in one way temporally. Um and the second is across institutions. So you mentioned you're talking about India. We can think more broadly. Um, uh, and and here, you know, India itself also has really interesting variation um, uh, in matrilineal and patrilineal institutions. So um, I wanted to give you a chance if you want to speak more on that front and on the temporal front. Um, I just wanted to highlight one thing you note, which is women's preferences are changing dramatically. They are getting much more progressive. And I would expect that is in part because women's bargaining power, um, as you say, their outside options are actually growing significantly despite the drop or the, the lever leveling off of we see of paid labor force employment. Um, and so I guess I wonder um, anything you wanna say about how you expect um, change to happen in the future, potentially as a part of different alliance structures. You mentioned we should be thinking about class. We should be thinking about caste, um, maybe also language, ethnicity, region. Um, are, do you see incentives for women to form new kinds of alliances that enable them to have new kinds of bargaining power that, that can shift norms at a faster pace than maybe the status quo beneficiaries men, men may be willing or interested in making? So I guess I'm not sure I see uh, women's bargaining power increasing as much mm. as you seem to think, suggest there is. Mm. If, uh, I'm not sure I've seen evidence suggesting that in general. Um, if anything, I think recently, mm. 
at least in India, kind of formal institutional judgments have been much more conservative mm -hmm. um, on things, not just like mm -hmm. marital rape, but even about uh, divorce and when mm -hmm. you can leave the, the house. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And I think this has happened. I mean, I think there is, um, you know, polit there is a growing body of work in political science, at least on norm backsliding. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. I, you know, so I, I mean, I, if anything, I would say the force that I see right now mm -hmm. temporally is mm -hmm. if you have class inequality, Mm -hmm. How do you get poor men to mm -hmm. vote for a group that is, you know, making you poorer? Mm -hmm. It's by playing on another identity, which is, you know, go back to the time when you were the head of the mm -hmm. household and you had power in the household. Yeah. And so you appeal, I think that's happening in Turkey, that's happening in India, you appeal to this notion that there is a domain where you're mm -hmm. the most powerful. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, hopefully not think so much about the other domains where you're economically worse off. Mm -hmm. And in that view, actually, I think what you're going to see is as economic inequality arises, you're mm -hmm. going to see normative backsliding, mm -hmm. um, not mm -hmm. uh, emergence of more progressive norms at mm -hmm. the social level. Mm -hmm. um, driven by men i realize you were talking about women being mm. becoming more liberal but i guess i haven't seen i've I, I feel like the dominant force i see is uh conservative norms being used by um by often parties that um want to uh, benefit from it mm. yeah and i think we can leave it at a difference of opinion but i will say i think you can consider backlash positive in the sense that it is, if it is a response to some kind of fundamental change, uh, it suggests that there is change. Whether whether what the quantum of that looks like in the long run is maybe a, a yeah. But I mean, the backlash could also just be because I'm I as a man am embracing more conservative norms because mm -hmm. I believe that's my source of power increasingly yeah. because yeah. I don't have more in the economic domain. Yes, so. and there's evidence of that in the U.S. as well. So, thank you, Rohini. Um, let me open it up to the broader audience. Um, I want to start with questions here. Um, yes, so I'll take these two men in the middle row, um, starting from the, the aisle, and then we'll go inward. Yes. And then I think there's hands down. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is George Hoge. I'm an institutional portfolio manager, um, but got a degree in economics at Boston University uh, and invested in India for many years. Uh, my question has to do with the practice of arranged marriages how extensive that is in India, how you think about that in terms of propagating norms and female self-images, and how we should interpret that in terms of either a Marxist or class struggle dynamic or uh, male-female dynamic. Thank you. And maybe we'll take three questions at a time to make sure there's enough yeah. chance to respond. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for the fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Si Wu. I'm a PhD candidate in political science at Boston University. And my dissertation topic is actually about gender dynamics in China after the uh, one-child policy is ended. So I just came back from doing field work in the country. So uh, I'm also very glad you mentioned that topic. So I'm really fascinated by the question that you asked, like why do women accept and enforce uh, norms and division of labor? And how has that changed over time and across different generations? So based on my uh, interviews with my various interviewees, uh, I noticed three different um, answers or mechanisms. The first one is, I think it's because of internet exposure. So uh, not only the access to, uh, to internet and also like what kind of discourses and discussions they've been exposed to online. And the second one, I think it's a broader uh, change in the structure of the economy uh, because uh, everyone in China now has more options in terms of their economic freedom. And I think that's uh, also uh, changed the gender norms in the country. And the third one I noticed throughout my few work is that um, there is a huge amount of economic pressure that comes with childbearing in China nowadays. I'm sure it's the same thing in other East Asian country like uh, Japan and South Korea that you mentioned. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any opinions on uh, these, um, this on a, from a comparative standpoint. Uh, thank you very much. We have one more question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, Professor. Uh, I'm not going to introduce myself because uh, I'm just a regular sophomore uh, here at BU and I have really nothing. I just 
um <laughs> just this is about you and the topic um so just give me a nod when you think that i've reached enough of like a framework and then you can go from there i just noticed like looking around um the room is predominantly women to begin with um i signed up because it was it said economics and i was like okay that's cool <laughs> um yeah so that's the honesty i wonder if we had framed this as like you had gotten to it later on in that uh, when you were talking about the poor men in India, you had said like, okay, if we approach that and we're like, instead of becoming richer, you become more influential and effective. If you're a poor man becoming stronger in yourself and with the woman and empowering that, that kind of unity. Um, and then so that's like a framing, like, is this event, is the name, like, starting with it as being like a women's empowering event? Like, is it possible to change this into like a a men, you, you will have a more successful marriage with a happier partner if these things. And so instead of starting it with like this sort of divisive term, it's like women's empowerment. I'm sure a lot more men might be, you know, um, subconsciously attracted by the idea of like the marriage is successful versus if it starts as like this women's thing it kind of sets off this progressive like mm, i'm not sure about this kind of feeling um and then more questions about implementation are like does is this something we should be focused on in current uh women's labors or is this something that needs to be kind of taught from uh childhood in that like you know, with the the invitation and um, you're you're adding these these phones, uh, the mobile phones into the the children um, or giving phones to children, I should say. Thank does you. that? Yeah. So yeah. okay, sorry. Does that balance um, start with like household chores and that the boys of the family will now see like because their sisters have phones, like now this kind of um, empowers like this the shared responsibility of chores because boys and girls have phones that's there's more but that's it yeah. thank you okay thanks so let me take these three great questions so thank you very much for engaging so first of all thank you for raising arranged marriage it's something actually i did want to mention i forgot so i really appreciate you raising it i think arranged marriage is a critical part of this right it's a way of sustaining um existing social structures and many of these uh, norms are closely linked to being within those social structures. So they'll be like caste specific norms, for instance, and that you want to have through arranged marriage. But again, I think what this is does is that the norm is very much that if you don't engage in an arranged marriage, you're a source of shame to the family. By doing that, you limit, limit a woman's agency to just go out and kind of find and marry someone she wants. And that again, then means is that your, outside, your options are more limited. So you're more likely to give in to this coercive contract because you know you you if you decide to go and just marry a man who will share your preferences you'll be cut off by your family you'll be cut off by many things because everyone will think that's a source of social stigma so i think that's exactly another way in which you create an institution that helps support the status quo so thank you for raising that i thought your discussion on china was fascinating i'd love to uh, talk more about it uh, i didn't have time and i actually don't have that much to say but i think the role of social media is fascinating you know I think the question of the time at which it actually challenges the status quo versus the time when it maybe enforces um, the view. So I think there's a lot of discussion right now in the literature on kind of misinformation, but I think there's very little study of actually what it's doing to uh, whether it challenges or reinforces gender norms. So, and you know, thank you for your comments. I think there are many different ways of approaching it, and I think you know uh, any talk is provocative in some ways and not others. So I think that's a choice I made. I think one could have gone a different way. I, have, I mean, I think, I don't think this is a value judgment on what you do. I was not, I mean, the aim of the talk is to put forward a thesis and defend it. It's not necessarily, for me, at least this talk was not a place where I was trying to affect change. Having said that, I think your view of, you know, what happens if we try to work at younger population, there is work there is research on this. So Divadhar, Tarun Jain, and Seema Jetra and Chandran have some very nice work saying that if you have kind of gender um, egalitarian education in schools, it seems to lead to in the short and medium run changes. Now, 
I think the very interesting question is whether these changes persist when you enter the labor market, when you get old enough, because there you could have imagine that even if I have personally more progressive, uh, uh, progressive uh, features, I'm now not in my school where everyone else was trained to be more progressive, but I'm in this labor market where these progressive norms as a man may actually make me uh, do worse in the labor market. So I think they're planning to continue to track them over time, which I think would be super interesting. Okay, so I think we will have to wrap up. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Ruhini, for giving us so much to Thanks. think about.